So hello from my side as well. My name is uh, Sebastian Daschner. I'm from uh, Germany. I'm a freelancer working mainly with Java. And I'm very happy to be here in Japan. It's actually my first time that I'm in Japan or in Asia. And the first time that I rode a motorbike together with Steven in this country. So it has been very exciting. And yeah, today I want to show you about putting hypermedia back in REST with JuxRS and using Java E technology. So who of you has been using REST in real world productions? Raise your hands, please. Who has been using REST? Uh, a few at least. Who has heard about REST or has a vague idea what's what that could be? Uh, a little bit more, all right. So um, let me show you about REST or what is considered to be REST in uh, real world projects. Because very often what is considered to be REST is not like what it's meant to be used. So people are using more or less it wrong. So maybe um, you have seen something like this in real world code. So y you have an URL which has more or less the meaning of a verb, do some action like make something and you have the HTTP verb post the method and uh, this is used to like more or less call an action and you have a request body this is the data which gets sent to the server right and a response body which uh, returns it and if you look at it it pretty much feels like a remote procedure call right it would be like calling a method over HTTP and this is probably not what, is, uh, what REST is considered to be. And if you look at the URL, it also feels like a verb. It feels like an action, do something, make something. This is not what, what resources should be. And also another example, which is used to retrieve information, like get some information. And this is obviously no, not the right way to go because we have the HTTP get, which should be used and not post in this case. Yeah, makes sense? Very good. So, um, yeah, what is REST uh, about? It's also about resources. Like you have URLs in your API, in your REST API, and these URLs should in fact reflect your business object. So your domain entities, which you have. For example, if you have an application with user management, right? Then your URL should be about user. You have a URL with, uh, which could be the list of all users. You have a URL with one specific user and so on and so forth. But you don't have a URL with get me all users or something with a verb rather than you have the real objects. Something like this. This is the user example. And you're getting, in this case, um, a list of users, which is the user's resource. And as a response, you can see in XML here, it doesn't matter if it's XML or JSON or something else, you have a list of all users, right? With the Duke user, it has an ID, it has a motto or something else. And this is more about the resources, about the objects which are used. You don't have um, a method here in this case. And now we can see that somewhat semantic HTTP was used because you don't use post because like everything is post, right? Rather than you use really the HTTP method as they were meant to be, like post, get, and so on and so forth. And the resources as they were meant to be, that it's not like actions you call rather than um, objects you can retrieve and you can work on. So this is the example to create a user. You still have that user's resource, which in fact is the list of our users, and now what you're doing, you're posting something to the resource. And if you look at uh, how HTTP is specified, the post says you're creating a new resource there, which you are in fact doing, you want to create a new user, right? And you're sending all the information, like the username, like the user motto, to that resource. Make sense? In the request body. And then the server says, okay, now, I created that new resource, that new location, and it worked. And to um, and the server, how to respond that it worked, it uses the HTTP status code. In this case, 201 created. So now you see again, not everything is like HTTP 200 okay, 
rather than there are several status codes which can be used to, to indicate the status on the server side. Because how that status code is defined, if you look it up, it says, okay, now a new resource has been created, which is the case for that user. And the second thing, the location here is the HTTP header. So it indicates the server where to find that newly uh, created user. Because the client sent some data to the server and now the server indicates where that can be found in the future. And this is the location um, header here. And this is exactly where hypermedia kicks in. Because in hypermedia you want to link related resources to your current resource and send the information to the client so that the client can use the URLs which are then included to navigate to the new points where, the, where to find the in information. Make sense? So now we have the same example like before with some small difference. Can you spot it? It's before that we had the ID with the user. And if you say you have this user's response here and you have the list of users and now you want to access one specific user and get more information, then before you had to take the user's URL, put a slash afterwards and put that ID 12345 on it so that the, u uh, that the client has the implicit logic how to create the URLs, which is bad because this should be solely on the server side, right? And now the server has the um, possibility to tell the client where to find the user instead. So you're not sending the ID, rather than you send the full URL in a link. And the link has a relation, which is self in this case. And all the client now has to know is that the self relation for the link somewhat directs to the URL where to find that specific user, that Duke in that case. So you may have a list of 100 users and each of this user, user have different URLs to the each user with a self-relation and from the self-relation the client knows that specific user can be found there. Questions so far? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yes, it's pretty much uh, a design decision. So on the server side, um, I can repeat the question. Uh, the question was we're using the IP, uh, the ID of the user here and whether that was a design decision or a technical um, decision. Yes, it is a design decision in this case, but actually it doesn't matter or it shouldn't matter to the client side. So the point is only the server should know about that if that is an ID or is a database ID or some hash or something else and the client should, should not know about it. It rather should follow that link each time when it gets the relation there. So very good question. Steve, he gets a sticker. <laughs> um, yes. And now we get a different example, which is somewhat more sophisticated. Um, this time it is JSON, but actually it doesn't matter for, uh, for hypermedia. And now we have a bookstore. If you think of Amazon, for example, something like that. So an API for a bookstore. And now we have a, a resource of one book. So that is one book with a name, an author, an availability, an ISBN, or price, whatever. Plus it has some links included in JSON in this case, which also has a self-relation again. This is the same book. And it has another link which uh, has the name or the relation add to card which is basically the URL where you can trigger the action when you want to add a specific book to your shopping cart. Like Amazon, you click on the shopping cart uh, icon and then you can buy the book, right? And this is how to tell the client where to find that URL. So in this case, um, you want to tell the client where, where you can find it. And what implications does that have? You can for example, uh, let me uh, give you an example. You want to add a fancy shopping cart button to the client, but maybe you want to activate that button only if the book is available or the user has some credit on his account 
or the user is over 18 years old. I, I don't know what. Whatever your business requirements, m requirements may look like. And the point is, you don't want to um, duplicate that logic on the server and on the client. So on the client, you don't want to say, if availability is something, then display that button, because then you have to do it twice and this shouldn't be on the client side, right? So now you can tell this uh, the server, or I actually you tell the client from the server, if you have this link, the add to cart link with that relation, so the client only knows that relation, and if that link is included, then the functionality is available for that specific case to be added to the shopping cart, and then the client can display the shopping cart button. Make sense? Any questions? All right, so this is also a way how to kind of include the business logic without uh, having needed it to be uh, redundant on the client side. All right, so now you may ask the question, I have the add to cart link, but how to access it? Because that add to cart probably won't be a simple get link, right? Rather than you need some information, like you want to post the add to cart to the add to cart resource, and you need a book ID maybe, or you need a quantity, how many books should be added, or to which user, and so on and so forth. So you need to post some information. And the client obviously needs to know, okay, what do I need to post? Because this is what you normally document in your REST API, right? So which resources do I have? Which information do I need to access that URLs, right? I need a post, I need a specific um, um, content type and so on and so forth and maybe some fields. And this is what hypermedia also enables uh, you on a certain level. So this is a somewhat more sophisticated example. Imagine the book resource we had before, like this. We had the books resource with a name, an author and some links and now we also have some actions. This is a special content type, I will explain that further in a minute. And this gives you the possibility to not only include the URL where to find some resource, rather than to get give more information how to access it with an HTTP method, post in this case, or a URL, or which content type should be used, or which information should be used. And what does that provide to you? What benefit does it have? Well, now you don't need to document how your add to cart functionality is used rather than you ship it directly in your API because now the client gets independent because now the client can use that information every time and if you change something then the client doesn't break because it can kind of adapt to what you sent to him to it so this uh, this means now you only need to know several certain information on the client side like the ID right you have some certain fields and now you only need to know okay how do i map the information i have to this fields because everything else comes from the server the server tells the url tells the http method and so on and so forth and now you can s um, you only have to know where does the id come from and what where does the quantity come from maybe the id is directly included in the response maybe the quantity is like a this uh, text field or a drop down field one two three four five books and so on and so uh, forth and this is totally fine to have it on the client side because this is client logic right and now this enables you much more using this hypermedia example um, so i just showed a more sophisticated example this was siren the siren um, content type there are actually a few like hypermedia enabled content types, most of them are just JSON with a special structure, which means it's a s standard uh, JSON, but in a special way that it's more or less standardized or none of them are real standards, uh, but kind of, yeah, they try to to, to form some uh, several standards where everybody can agree on. So you can have a look, if you're interested in that topic, you can have a look at these content types um, hell is pretty much uh, used, the first one. The reason why I didn't show it was um, that it doesn't allow these actions. It only allows links, but not this um, kind of functionality where you can provide more information about how 
more sophisticated examples can be used. Um, collections and JSON is uh, is another interesting one. What also is very good is JSON schema because this gives you another possibility that you not only um, yeah, show what I just showed you in the API, rather than you can only include how your business objects look like. So for example, username, that you can kind of describe what is a username or what kind of properties does a user have at all. What is a username, what is a book, ISBN and so on and so forth. And then you can even get rid of that documentation because that would be included in your API as well. You only have to implement it. And that's the keyword, let's implement something. Do you have questions so far for the examples I showed? So now you get a rough feeling for what is hypermedia and what's, what's it good for, for hypermedia REST? Yeah. Okay, then let's start um, the presentation. So um, I will use in IntelliJ for my purposes. Think. Let me wait till it starts. If you have any question, any time, then feel free to ask, please. All right. So now we go to the command line, and I will create a project here. Um, I will use Maven to create some default projects. Who has been using Maven before to build projects? Only one. That can't be possible. Maven, Maven, come on. Yeah, two, three. Okay. <laughs> Let's call it Jux RS Hypermedia. Okay, this is just a small script. Um, this creates a default Maven project. I will show that in a minute. It's very fast. And now we can open it. And this is just newly created, so nothing, I prepared nothing, this is just as is. I will increase that font size in a minute. Oops. So how's that? Okay, um, to anybody who has been using Maven so f uh, before, this is just a POM file, this is the description how your Maven project looks like. And as you can see, as we're using standard Java E in this example, ja uh, standard Java E7, is it only includes the Java E7 dependency and this comes as a provided. So it will not be included in your WAR file. And this is one of the most simplest examples because then your WAR file only cont uh, contains what you um, write. Um, include in it. So this project is basically empty. It only has the JuxRS uh, configuration, but it's not really interesting. It's just uh, the bootstrap for the JuxRS thing. And now we will um, include a resource. Um, before that it was about books. So let's uh, do that example. It's called, is that enough? Yeah, books resource. So this will be a JuxRS resource. So for everybody who's been using JuxRS uh, before, this is really boring because it's very simple. <laughs> so you use at path the annotation to declare it as a JuxRS root resource with the books um, information so that it will be the books URL. And now we, of course, need to return some books so we have a list of books, right? Get books in this case. And as this is a Java E7 project, the books probably come from some EJB in this case. 
let's call it bookstore and we will create that EJB just for you so this is an EJB called stateless and it will just return some books here it for this example it doesn't matter where the books uh, come from it may be some database lookup or something else so we um, create the book as well the book in this case will oh come on <laughs> doesn't want me to okay let's do it the other way this will be just um, a pojo containing some simple information like um, a name, an ID we had, and probably an author, and a price. Just to be sure, please don't do uh, money calculations with floating point numbers in real world projects. This is just an example. All right. So now we will add getters and setters. And just for convenience, um, default and custom constructors. All right, this should be clear. It's just a simple pojo. And now we have the bookstore. And we um, will return some default books with like, oh, actually, I've been wondering about that several times. So for a new version, IntelliJ does some weird sorting things here. <laughs> it resorted the um, the properties I didn't want on the constructor, but anyway, um, Java, written by Duke, 9.99, and another book, book number two. Hello, world. All right. So this is very simple. It's just the EJB. And now we can access that information from the bookstore and return it. And yeah, this is actually pretty boring because it doesn't include anything hypermedia specific so far. It just includes all the information we have. So I won't even run that example. It's it's too boring. But if you look if you remember the slides, and um, we want to have an example like this, only that it's maybe JSON, not XML. So we want to include links to our books, right? D um dynami dynamically. So now we can I, I would uh, show several approaches. This is an approach how to include the links directly in the POJO, which means we could do something like a map here from string to URIs. The string will be the relation. So we have a map from the link relations to the actual URIs. And the name is links. And now what's even possible uh, even though we have JSON and not um, XML, we could still use the JAXB annotations to modify the JSON output. So that um, works as the JSON, implement, uh, JSON frameworks take care of the JAXB annotations in this case. We so we can specify a name here, say we want the underscore links and not the normal links. And we could also say we want uh, the ID to be transient so that it's not included in our JSON output, right? So we could use the XML root element plus the XML accessor type field because our JAXB annotations are on the fields. And now we will include a getter and setter for a nice link map. And now we're done on the poacher side. And now what can we do on the JAXRS resource. Now the interesting thing starts because we want to include the links here, right? And the links may be dependent on how you configure your JAXRS resource, like this one. So this means the links may include that books 
as the link may look like book slash 12345, right? So we want to use some functionality how that links could be created. Um, yeah, we, we have the books in this case. And now we can say books dot, and as we're using Java E7 with Java 8, we will use fancy Lambda str uh, and streams here, which means um, for each, just because we can, we say book dot get links. This is the li uh, book link map, and we can add some links plus relations here. So we want to add that self relation maybe, and somewhat self URI. And the self URI here, that's the interesting thing. Let's decrease that a little bit. It's still readable. We need more space. That comes from a functionality we could use here, which is called URI info. This is um, something JAXRS specific. It's a component which can be um, in injected using add context. It's an act con a context, context managed bean from JAXRS and it provides you functionality to programmatically create links based on your JAXRS configuration and your JAXRS resources. Which means you can say your I info get base your I builder dot um, path and now you can specify the resource class here, the same class like we are, we are in. And what does it help us? It now gets this string from the annotation at path and will construct an URL with that URI, uh, URI path in it. Plus, we can say now we have books. What we want, I uh, want to have books slash one, two, three, four, five. And of course, I forgot something here. This is a get resource and it uses a path using, um, uh, sorry, it doesn't have a path here because it's the um, resource for all books. And we have a second one, which I will implement in a minute, but just that you get uh, the, the idea how it is constructed. We have a path parameter here because in this case, it's a single book and it says get book from ID basically. And the ID comes from a path para parameter and it is the ID in this case. So the point is we don't tell the client how this logic looks like here, how the URIs are constructed on the server side, rather than we just provide the links. But the server has to know how they are created. So I will implement that in a minute, it doesn't matter for now. But now we can get the information, how that is created from another functionality. So now we have the books resource class again, and now we can I include even a name for a method, which searches for the books resource, which we are in, plus that method here, which means it gets this string here, which is the uh, class plus the method, it is the other path, part of the path. And now we, s we have books slash ID, but we don't want to have curly bracket ID, curly bracket, rather we want to have the real ID, right? So this placeholder down there, this one, has to be substituted with the real ID, which means there is another functionality here. When you build the whole URI, that you um, provide some variables which will be then used to substitute the path parameters. In this case, it is the book ID. So we say book.getID and now that is used to substitute that path and everything at once is used to construct the self URI, which is then included into the links map. Make sense? Any questions so far? Everything crystal clear? All right. Don't hesitate to ask questions. You get nice presents and stickers from Steve. Okay.
Do you mean like the different content types we had? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's a very good question and that's very interesting. So the question was basically, there are several approaches and, and content types so far and which one is the most, the best, the popular, the one to take. Yeah, actually there, there isn't one, unfortunately, so far. So I will talk about that uh, in a minute. Of course, there have been several yeah, ideas which one should be standardized and things like that, but none of them has won so far. So every, everything there has pros and cons. Some of them are simpler, but then you don't have the full control over everything, but then you can do it in a more simple way, which is good, if it fits your needs. And more others are more complex, which is also good if you need a more complex scenario, but it's very yeah, cumbersome if you want to code very simple examples. You know, So it's always like a bit trade-off. I will talk about that in a minute, but very good question. I think you already have a sticker, right? <laughs> Please, more, more questions. If you have uh, questions anytime, feel free to ask. All right. So this was the first example for the list of books. And now we want to do the same thing for one book. So in our EJB, we need another method to return one book. Get book from one ID, which for this simple example just creates a new book by the ID. And that's it, because the imp interesting part for now is on the JAX-REST side, um, which means we call the bookstore again with the get book, and it returns a book. And now we can kind of copy-paste logic <laughs> down there with the same um, information, book.getID on book get links create that link and now we have if you remember the slides a different example so this is somewhat that example using json because we have the add to cart link in this case which may only be included if some certain business logic applies and now for the um, resource which contains one book that link also should be displayed so we can copy paste that line add to cart as well and this is an add to cart URI which is another URI created by URI info again and this time we need another resource like cart resource this is another JAX-RS class. It's not already, uh, it's not there because this is a very simple example, but it doesn't matter. We will just create it, cut resource. And for our example, it doesn't matter if it's just empty because for now we don't want to code the, sh uh, the shopping cart. We want to show the books resource, but we need this one that JAX-RS can access it and create the URI, right? Because we need that annotation here. All right, no, um, that's the wrong one. Books resource. And now we access the URI of the shopping cart resource here and build it without parameters. So we it would just build a URI containing shopping cart here. Okay, and that second thing gets included there as well. And now you could, of course, say if only some uh, fancy business logic applies then all that stuff gets created right but for now we will always do that and return the book and that's basically it so now we have the same thing plus the other URI as we had before questions so far okay now we will we will run it as an example using um, the JSON media type so I will add add produces to the JAX-RS resource which tells um, the server what kind of content type it should create from our POJO. In this case we want to have um, the media type application JSON. Media type. 
so we have JSON in this case. And now, if we've done everything right, it works. So I just said before we will use Maven to build the project. So we will, sorry, I have to go to the right directory. We will use Maven to build the project here. And as a default Maven project is very simple, this is very fast, even faster than I could talk. Not even three seconds, the project is compiled and built. And I just said before, it builds to a WAR file, which will be deployed to an application server, a Java E application server. And the WAR file, we can actually look at it. And this is the cool thing about Java E, it's basically empty because it only contains your few classes. Yeah, you can see them here the book, the bookstore, card resource, and that's it. Because the whole Java E API is just an API which you program against but it's not included as it's already on the server because the server knows Java E and JAXRS and all the things there. So now we will deploy it um, on Wildfly and as I said this is a pretty tiny wall so it's very very fast and now it's already done. And now to show um, it to you we will fire up a REST client of our choice I will use Postman in this example. It actually doesn't matter which one you take. This is just easy to use. Um, you could use whatever you like, even the command line. But just the browser doesn't work because you need a, a REST client here. So we do um, localhost 8080 in this case. The name was uh, Juxeres Hypermedia. Then we had resources. This is the part which I didn't show you. This is the JuxRS application class. It's just a bootstrap thing where all the resources reside. And then we have books. Um, no, sorry. <laughs> I can't increase the font size. I can show you a different example. Um, or actually, I could use it from the command line. This is another challenge for me. Which is which is good. <laughs> so, oops. Let me show you that example. And I can increase the front size here. So now we say, this is what I just uh, said before. We could use the command line as well. So we use curl in this case, localhost uh, 8080 juxtres hypermedia resources books. And now, of course, this is not that fancy, but I think we can add, let me think about that, some fancy Python script. Yeah, that works. Now it is even pretty printed JSON in this case. And now you can see this is the list of our books in this case. So we have JSON. And it has a name and author price. It didn't have the it has the ID because we excluded it using Jux B annotations, and it has the links we programmatically created. And as you can see, this is an absolute link to one of the books here. And now we can follow that link so that we specify. Okay, please now go to the first one, book slash one. And now you can see this is the same book, but it has more information as on the books resource, you get the link to the add to cart, which is now the URL to the shopping cart, which is pretty nice. And now to show you another cool thing of JuxRS, you could even use, and this is why, um, where is it? Why I used that dot get base URI builder there you could use a different um, URI in this case. I changed the my local host file that this URI is also points to localhost. So it's the same as you would write localhost. But now as you can see, magically, the server returns that domain as well. Because that get base URI builder, and that's the cool thing, makes use of the current client request. And the client request includes the domain where it's been sent to. So, for example, for an enterprise scenario where you often have a proxy server in front of your application server and the proxy server has the real URI of your ap uh, application, then you just fire up against that real URI and your application behind that proxy still 
has the information out of the client request and can magically build your eyes to the correct URL, which, which is pretty cool. And this is fully included in Jux REST standard. You can ju just use it right away using Java E. All right, questions so far? Yes, please. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. That, uh, that's a good question. So the question was, from an architectural point of view, is it a good way to include your, the URIs in kind of your POJOs, in your domain models? I would say it depends on what you're trying to do. So for simple, um, simple applications, yes, why not? First of all, uh, on your first approach. Um, of course, if you have some other information that you say your response then includes some other information which is not c part of your domain model, like some calculated data, some aggregated data, then it totally makes sense to have a different kind of POJO or different kind of object created, maybe programmatically. Uh, I'll show a different approach in a second. And which then gets created from another component and is not your domain object, right? So I would say it totally depends on what you're trying to do, but a very good point that you're probably not including your URIs to your real business objects which reside in the database, right? Because then you would have to exclude it in the database using JPA transient and so on and so forth. So yeah, very good point. So because, uh, because of that, I will um, code just another example because now we had that simple example here using some simple links. But what if you want to do something like that? Like the siren example uh, I showed you, which has some actions or another content type which has some crazy complex logic telling the client what to, what to do on the hypermedia perspective. Because then, as you said, you don't want to include all that things here to your POJO. Because then your POJO has to have something like actions and the actions have to be nested objects. You, you don't want that in your code, right? So there has to be another approach to achieve that. So therefore, um, so let's delete everything again <laughs> in the same resource. So therefore, JuxRS, or more or less Java E7, has another cool feature um, called JSONP, like API for JSON processing, which is basically an API to programmatically create JSON objects, where you have the full control how your JSON may look like. So you don't need a POJO to map it, right? So now we have the same method again, get books, and we have a JSON array, which comes from JSONP. And that get books has the get annotation again. And now we say we have the bookstore. Again, this is the same just like before, get books. But this time we will create a JSON P object out of them. So, of course, we will use lambdas and streams again. So we have the book. And now th the book should be um, created into a JSON object. This is one JSON object. And the JSON array obviously contains of several JSON things. And now there is an API JSON.createObjectBuilder, which is actually a builder pattern and it gives you the possibility to add some things and these are the properties in your JSON object. So we had the name before for the books, right? Which comes from book.getName. We had an author, which is the author. We had a price. And of course we had the links there. This is, uh, this is another um, object and this is of course a nested object so um, we will just call it call it links and now at the end we uh, we can call dot build and this builds the JSON object so this is now a JSON object there and in our map lambda we will return it so that it can be used 
info uh, right away. But for now, we need to in to add that link JSON object. So how that is created? And this is a the same thing again: a nested create object builder, which includes, of course, the self for the self relation, and then the self um, URI again. And it just found out that I deleted it, but it doesn't matter. We will create it again using the same oops, um, functionality just as before with the path from the bookstore uh, books resource and the other path from the books resource dot get book and we build it using the get ID from that book. And now, as you can see, as uh, JSONB can't handle your eyes, it only can handle primitive and strings, you will have to call dot st a to string um, to include it as a string. Dot to string on a URI just creates the same thing as a string. And now we call dot build to um, have the nested j JSON object, which uh, is then included in the links here. And now this whole thing is mapped. So now we have from the list of books, we have a stream of books. And then we have a stream of JSON object using that dot map functionality. And now we collect the whole thing in a JSON array. And just because we can, we will use fancy method handles there. JSON uh, create array builder and array builder add and JSON array builder colon colon add. And now we have a JSON array builder, and we can add, uh, we can call dot build, and the whole thing, uh, oops, gets returned there. If I could spell, and now this is returned in a method. So what do we do here? We call the EJB, like before. Dot get books. Please give us the list of books. We created a Java 8 stream of out of it. That's a stream of books. Then we um, dot mapped the stream of books to a stream of JSON objects. We programmatically created the URI, just like before. We created a nested URI object for the JSON, for the self link. And now we created a JSON object for that specific book using that nested link object. And then at the end, we collected all of the JSON objects and put it into a array. Questions so far? All right. And now, just as before, we will do uh, oops, the same thing for uh, the ID. And now this is just a single JSON object. Get book from an ID, just like before. We have the path parameter. This uses um, JoxRS features to access this. And now it's even simpler. And of course, we can copy-paste logic again. Don't do this in real-world uh, projects. So in real-world, you probably want to um, outsource all that thing into a several component like a CDI managed bean where you all your entities are created. But for now it works. We have the bookstores get book from the ID again. And then we have a single book. And now the book is used here to create that URI again. And now we have a different thing, just as before, we have a second URI for that shopping cart again. So the shopping cart URI, using the same functionality just as before, cartresource.class and dot build, and that's it. So we have the second URI, which then is also added to this nested JSON object, right? The add to cart link using the shopping cart URI dot to string. And now this is included in that links um, property as well. And now that's basically it for the JSONP example. 
So why did we do that? As you can see, we now have the full control how our JSON objects look like. And so that you believe me, I will run that again. So we'll just kill the currently running example and I will rebuild the whole project. And as you can see, it's very fast still. We'll use uh, Wildfly again to run the Java E7 project and it's deployed as well. So now we can go, oh, you want to have the command line, right? So we go back to the command line and say, yeah, this is the same thing here. Now you don't see any difference. Um, this is the same resource just as before, called uh, the same service. And it also, and it, yeah, again, returned the same information, but this time it doesn't come from the POJO, rather than it just comes from the JSON P approach and the programmatically created JSON object. And the same is true for the single book resource. So any questions so far? Everything clear? You still get stickers from Steve? <laughs> so very good. Um, yeah, now as you can see, that JSONB approach gives you um, the full control over your content type and over your um, response bodies. And now it is no problem to create respo uh, responses as such. And now you can have full control over your content type. You could use co uh, whatever content type as you may. And now you could even invent your own content type and include all the information using that programmatic JSONP approach. And I have something more to show you. No, this time I can increase the font size. This is a um, project of mine where I show some of these examples. It's on GitHub. Um, Estashna Jaxores Hypermedia. And it shows just what I uh, did before in a more uh, complex example. Um, for example, I will tell you the link in a second. This is another Siren example, what I just briefly showed. And it also has this books here, but with a more sophisticated example. So you have a full Siren here the Siren content type, you have these actions, which I, sh I just showed before. You have the, uh, the shopping cart there, which includes the sev uh, several books, book selections, and so on and so forth. And yeah, this uses, uh, for example, that Siren content type, which I consider as a pretty reasonable content type for hypermedia, as it is not too bloated with the meta information, but still has the possibility to use actions and so on and so forth. But I encourage all of you to have a look at several hypermedia content types which are out there. I showed a few uh, on my slides. And then you can kind of find out for your own which would be a good one for your hypermedia API to use, which pros and cons there are. So the link is Estashna Juxres Hypermedia. You can find the project on GitHub. All right. Do you have still questions left? You sure? No questions at all? All right. Then thank you very much for your attention.